chapter 31 of the book God dictated to me as he dictated uh, the Torah to Moses. As Orthodox Judaism believes, what they don't know, the rabbis, all of them, is that he also uh, had every prophet write their respective books. There's some exceptions for the most part. Uh, and probably had some of them do the writings. David could very well have written the books he's in. I think that's Samuel 1 and 2 and Kings 1. Um, briefly, I think that's, it starts out with his death. I'm not sure. But uh, Joshua could have written Joshua. That's how you're supposed to think about it. Whoever the lead character is in the, in the book, just assume... God uh, commanded and directed and basically dictated what, what they were to write for their books. And there's ways to verify that. And you can find that on different videos. I'm going to pick up with uh, a really good chapter and get into it right away. I am the righteous servant Moshe. Prophet like Moses and Elijah. You say, how can that be? That's kind of what I said when he told me. <laughs> There are six unfulfilled prophecies remaining in this day of the Lord in the Hebrew Bible. And there's no question this is the day of the Lord. And you can find that. Actually, I have a video on the day of the Lord if you want to know how that works. But it's undeniable. You know, you got to put four books together. Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah in particular. Ezekiel and Malachi 3, where the day of the Lord is announced. It's today. It's this day. Victory and vindication. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me as a herald of joy to the humble, to build up the wounded of heart, to proclaim release to the captives, liberation to the imprisoned, to proclaim a year of the Lord's favor and a day of vindication by our God. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me is a direct reference to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. The anointed one, Moshe. And says that the Spirit of God alighting upon a man is an anointment by God. That's like, you know, you get an anointment, they usually drop oil on your head here in the real world, not the unseen uh, universe of God. So, we know that the speaker is presumably Moshe, which would be the righteous servant Moshe. It cannot be Jesus, though he said he was the fulfillment of it. This, what I just read, he's declaring the day of the Lord in his day. Now, <laughs> it doesn't fit for so many reasons, because the purpose that might prosper of Isaiah 53 is found in Malachi 3. God says, I'm sending my messenger before me to clear, uh, to clear the way. And I shall return to my temple suddenly. Okay, but Elijah's got to clear the way. We don't have a temple. It's got to be built. It's my job to be instrumental in making the Jewish people understand it is imperative that they build it. It avoids utter destruction to the land. Build it, never defeat it dispersed again. So it can't be Jesus because one, because one, the temple is there. Don't need anybody to clear the way for God. Not only that, God's in his temple in the days of Jesus. Why would he be returning? It doesn't make any sense. And Jesus was familiar with Malachi 3. He uses the, uh, verse 1 uh, to describe his cousin John the Baptist as Elijah the messenger that clears the way 
There was nothing to clear. This is, who is this? Luke, the historian. Chapter 4, verses 16 through 21 of the New Testament. And he, that would be Jesus, taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, that is Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the broken hearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. It's the one I just read at the beginning of this video. And recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the day of the Lord he's talking about. And he's just throwing in a bunch of things you couldn't possibly find in the Hebrew Bible. And he closed the book. And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. In the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened to him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now this day it is. The fulfillment of the remaining six prophecies, unfulfilled, are fulfilled. Four righteous servants to come, fulfilled. Two covenants to be delivered. I'm working on that. They're, they're both in this book. They go into effect when this book's published. God's book. Um, <laughs> trying to get centered. The year of the Lord's favor and a day of vindication by our God, he said is a reference to the awesome, fearful day of the Lord of Malachi 3 and the return of God to his temple. The day of the Lord's favor and vindication proclaimed by Jesus ended in his crucifixion and death. God was in his temple. And 40 or so years later, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple of God. And that's not supposed to happen after Elijah comes, if there's a temple. Never defeated, dispersed again. To proclaim release to the captives and liberation to the imprisoned, according to Rashi, means, that is, this is Rashi, that is to say, this is his commentary on this, that is to say, to bring them the tidings of the redemption they are going to be redeemed. The world's going to know that God is the God of Israel. And that's it. Created everything. He's the God of all creation, all of humanity. But he is the God of Israel and the Jewish people. That's who he chose. To provide for the mourners in Zion. This is Isaiah 61 verses 3 through 4 to provide for the mourners in Zion to give them a turban instead of ashes the festive ointment instead of mourning a garment of splendor instead of drooping spirit they shall be called terebinths of victory planted by the Lord for his glory and they shall build the ancient ruins Raise up the desolation of old and renew the ruined cities, the desolations of many ages. Over 2,000 years from when Rome drove out the Jewish people, heading towards uh, Europe for the most part, I guess. Not all of them. 
is known as uh, the Roman dispersal, and they call it the diaspora, which means away from the top promised land. And that's who Jeremiah 31 is for. Because it's sin forgiveness in 31, verse 31, chapter 31, verse 31. And uh, as, uh, God did the same thing for the 13 tribes. All 13 tribes returned. As Ezra said, they gathered as one man. Has to be all 13 tribes. And, uh, and God says so too. And uh, he's right. I speak to him face to face, friend to friend, as Moses did. He just directs me to a, part, a place in the room. His power envelops me. He's within me and without me. That's how he talks to a man. He basically manipulates your mind. And I can feel his presence. It's heavy. Um, <laughs> sometimes very heavy. He wants to pin you to the ground like he did at Ezekiel. Um, the Assyrian Babylonian exiles that returned became the Roman dispersal eventually who have now returned 1948 and created the state of Israel and renewed the ruined cities and the desolation of many ages. This is Jeremiah 31 verses 38 through 40. See, a time is coming, declares the Lord, when the city shall be rebuilt for the Lord, that would be Jerusalem, from the tower of Hanel to the corner gate, and a measuring line shall go straight out to the Garib Hill, and then turn towards Goab, and the entire valley of the courses and ashes, and all the fields as far as the Wadi Kidron, and the corner of the horse gate on the east shall be holy to the Lord. They shall never again be uprooted or overthrown. Caveat to that is, you got to get the temple built or other destruction. You got seven million or so Israeli Jews right now. I should think other destruction would kill six million. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Never again, never forget, right? One thing you can forget. The teachings of the rabbis of world exaltation of the Jewish people. It's never going to happen. Not in the Hebrew Bible. Neither is the Messianic era that's supposed to begin with the arrival of Moshiach. Never going to happen. That's primarily from Rambam. Teaching man's word. And it conflicts with the covenant of friendship. Conflicting with God's word. Okay, so anyway, this is Jerusalem today. It cannot be the Jerusalem in the days of Jesus and John the Baptist for the reason that the Jewish people were uprooted and overthrown by Rome and dispersed throughout the world. It's not supposed to happen. And, and there wouldn't be a need for other destruction if Elijah can't clear the way for God by having a third temple built. Because the temple was there in the days of Jesus, and God was in his temple. The time to come is today, when there is a temple to be built for God to return to. And the day of the Lord is to ensure they are never uprooted and overthrown again. Jeremiah 31, verses 27 28. See, the time is coming, declares the Lord. When I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with seed of men and seed of cattle. And just as I was once over them to uproot and pull down, to overthrow and to destroy and to bring disaster, so I will be watchful over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. That's when I say the land blooms again. See, the time is coming. And it does. It was desolation in 1948. It's all been rebuilt. Beautiful country. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. See, a time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them 
out of the land of Egypt, a covenant which they broke. Though I espoused them, married them, anyway. This is in the book of Hebrews of the New Testament about the new covenant that I'm getting ready to read. Uh, and they changed that. It doesn't say, but I espoused them. That's in the Hebrew Bible. They changed it to say, and I regarded them not. <laughs> they just changed it. That's in the book of Hebrews. Nobody knows who wrote it. But such is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my teaching into their innermost being and inscribe it upon their hearts. Then I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the first covenant. He's just making an amendment confirmation of the first covenant. But within, yeah, with an amendment, of course. My people will no longer need to teach one another and say to one another, Heed the Lord, for all of them, from the least of them to the greatest, shall heed me, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their inequities and remember their sins no more. He knows that's not going to, not everybody's going to heed him. And you know he knows it because of Malachi 3, because he flat out says it. But those that do heed and revere his name will go into the scroll of remembrance and see the special Jewish heaven. That won't include rabbis unless they recognize me, listen to his prophet, which is listening to God, and teach the matters of this book. God wants Judaism out of antiquity into the modern era. And there's a lot of things to be changed. The time to come is the day of the Lord. I will put my teaching into their innermost being and inscribe it upon the hearts of the new covenant is a way of saying the purpose of Elijah, which is said to bring the families of the Jewish people back to practicing Judaism and righteousness will prosper. Recounsel the sons to the father and the father to the sons is, is how it generally reads. God could see Greece and Rome and their mythology of gods and men who are gods and knew they were coming one day. And when they found the people of the book of one God, that destruction of the second temple and expulsion from the land was coming with them and that the land would be desolate for ages. God's prophecy is based on absolute knowledge of humanity from beginning to end. In the days of Jeremiah, it was time to look forward to the days of the third temple. And God had Jeremiah write his words accordingly. Same for Ezekiel, same for Malachi. Sin forgiveness is in the book of Isaiah for the Assyrian Babylon exiles and the second temple become a holy city. Well, he's doing it again. And sin forgiveness for the Roman dispersal and the third temple is in the book of Jeremiah for a time to come. The time when Israel returns to the land of desolation and makes it bloom again and renews the old cities and rebuilds Jerusalem. And that is today. Isaiah 61 verse 5. Strangers shall stand and pasture your flocks. Aliens shall be your plowmen and vine trimmers. In the return of the Assyrian Babylon exiles, the northern kingdom was inhabited by Gentiles, imported by the Assyrians after they defeated the northern kingdom. <coughs> it's sometimes called Israel, sometimes Ephraim, and um, what's the other one? <laughs> There's another name. <laughs> it's not the one. Today, the stranger among the Jewish people are the Israeli Arabs and Israeli Christians. The aliens are the trespassers, Palestinians, 
and Arabs who are not Israelis. Israel, Israelis. Isaiah 61, verse 6. While you shall be called priests of the Lord and termed servants of our God, you shall enjoy the wealth of nations and revel in their riches. The Assyrian Babylon exiles were forgiven of all sins to become a holy seed of God, and they rebuilt the second temple. <coughs> they are referred to as servants of God in their sinless state and not God's righteous servant. Elijah comes and delivers the new covenant with sin forgiveness for the Roman dispersal to be a holy seed, and they will rebuild the third temple for God. They certainly need to. I don't know why they have it. It doesn't have to be on Temple Mount, just on Mount Zion. That's in the Hebrew Bible. He didn't want the Temple Mount. He says it's too small. Painted by Islam and controlled by Jordan. Doesn't want anything to do with it. For God to return to suddenly with the assistance of God's righteous servant as David the shepherd. That's what God calls him. Israel is one of the greatest countries on earth. They have wealth and riches equal to any nation for its size and more than most. The nations are not going to give Israel their wealth and riches as many believe will happen in the redemption area. They have the same wealth and riches. Basically, it's written for antiquity. This is thing, you know, the people of antiquity went through a very harsh time. And there's a lot of, of, of discussion of this in this book and on video. Um, this is something they wanted to hear, which is a common practice today. The rabbis telling people what they want to hear. Jewish people want to hear the world's going to love them one day, but the world's hated them since uh, their existence for being the chosen people, among other things, for saying they are even. This is Isaiah 61, 7 through 9. Because your shame was double, men cried, disgrace is their portion. Assuredly, they shall have a double share in their land. Joy shall be theirs for all time. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery with a burnt offering. I will pay them their wages faithfully and make a covenant with them for all time. Their offspring shall be known among the nations. That's the Gentiles, Gentile countries, Christian countries. Their descendants in the midst of the people was not just Christians. I know, that's, okay. But anyway, it's not just Christians. <laughs> well, Chinese are Gentiles. They're not, for the most part, Christians. They shall be known among the nations, their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall recognize that they are stopped. The Lord has blessed. That's verses 7 through 9. Verse 8 references the covenant made with Moses and the Israelites, which is eternal, but never complete until the vindication of the Lord in this, the awesome, fearful day of the Lord of Malachi 3. When God makes a new covenant with the Jewish people, that includes he will be their God and they will be his people. An amendment, renewal, and confirmation to be mindful of his laws by those who heed and fear him and his name instead of strict compliance. That's the amendment. The Israelites were, said, were told, you got to do everything Moses says. Now he's saying being Moses, I mean, be mindful of the things Moses said, of my laws and uh, instructions. And he doesn't really explain what that means. I mean, every you know, you got the Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform in Judaism, and they're going to have to decide for themselves how, to, how that fits the way they practice Judaism.
The recognizing among the nations that the Jewish people are stock the Lord has blessed requires that the third temple be built. Isaiah 61, verses 10 through 11. I greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being exults in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of triumph, wrapped me in a robe of victory, like a bridegroom adorned with a turban, like a bride bedecked with her finery. For as the earth brings forth her growth, and a garden makes the seed shoot up, so the Lord God will make victory and renown shoot up in the presence of all the nations, all the Gentiles. Victory and renown for the Assyrian Babylon exiles was the building of the second temple, despite the attempts of the Gentiles in the northern kingdom to stop the building. Rome destroyed that temple. Victory and renown for the Roman dispersal will be in the building of the third and final temple. God calls my eternal temple. Of God, despite the attempts of the nations to stop them. There may be people in the middle. Well, if you try to do it on Temple Mount, you can bet you're going to get a lot of resistance. But I don't know how any of the, the nations, the Gentiles, can do anything but be a bother like the Gentiles of the Northern Kingdom were in the building of the Second Temple. And they will never be uprooted over time again. Caveat, you have to build the Temple or other destruction to the land. Next chapter. This is very interesting. I told you there's a lot of information here that only Elijah would have. You know, God taught it to me, and then God said, write this down. The next one, chapter 32, the new heaven. It's very interesting. It's just for the Jewish people. I'm going to take a break on that. <laughs> With God's permission, right? Now, he told me to take a break. <laughs>